Thanks for joining us this morning. We're here on the lands of the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri peoples, the traditional custodians of the country in and around Canberra. And we pay our respects to elders past and present and those who may be emerging. Welcome to the first episode of Lower Chi Live. Lower Chi Live is an exciting new series of webinars and podcasts exploring Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health research in Australia. The series will showcase Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander researchers, knowledges and projects across Australia. We also want to highlight the role of First Nations peoples in setting the research and health agenda and outcomes for our peoples. Lower to Live will be broadcast on our social media and YouTube channels. We hope you'll follow us for future episodes. We are pleased and proud to launch the series during NADOC week. The NADOC theme always was, always will be, recognises that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have occupied and cared for this con continent for over 65,000 years. It gives us an opportunity to reflect on our connection to our country and remind people that culture is a, pro is a protective factor for our peoples and our communities. To launch Lower Chi Live, we are so pleased to have with us Professor Ian Anderson AO, Deputy Vice-Chancellor at the Australian University. Ian is a Palawa man from the northwest coast of Tasmania with traditional ties to Trebekuna country. Prior to the ANU, Ian served as the Deputy Secretary of Indigenous Affairs in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet and Deputy Chief Executive of the National Indigenous Australia's Agency. He has spent most of his professional life working in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health and education and graduated as a doctor in 1989. He was awarded his PhD in 2006. Ian has worked with the Victorian Aboriginal Health Service, chaired ministerial councils, including National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Equality Council and, and held successive leadership roles at the University of Melbourne. Ian is an officer of the Order of Australia and has been appointed a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences and Academy of Health and Medical Sciences. He has also worked with the Lowitcher Institute in our days as a cooperative research centre and we are so pleased to have him join us this morning. Welcome Ian. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks Ian. Could you start off by telling us a bit about your story? Okay, so I might, I might start up on the northwest coast and then fast forward in, into medicine. So my, um, I, I was born in Devonport. Um, my family had lived up the coast, both sides of my family, Aboriginal and the non-Aboriginal side, for uh, a long time um, with, with as, as you said before, traditional ties up, up the east coast. Um, I... Uh, my, my dad was a labourer, so we, we moved quite a bit as kids. I think I lived in about 20 different homes before the age of 20, uh, all with my family. Um, and I had moved around most parts of uh, country Tasmania, um, southern New South Wales, central Victoria. And I kind of, I think, at some point formed a an idea that I wanted to go to university. I didn't want to be a... couldn't see myself living the labouring life um, as, as much as I respected my old man and, and still do. Um, uh, and my, my, my folks kind of had an idea that we should get educated. I don't think they knew what that meant. Um, and so <coughs> at some point I was in my teen years and I, um, I went to a... Um, and we were in Bendigo at the time, and I went to uh, one of those careers nights, and I came back and I told my mother that I was going to be a doctor. Uh, at which point, she dropped her crochet, and 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 said, you know, actually on on the night I graduated, which was about eight years later, said, I'm so sorry, I, I just so, was so scared for you that you had set up these ambitions and you wouldn't mm. be able to get there anyway. I did. I, I, I was fortunate to have a really fabulous secondary school education uh, in, in public schools in Bendigo where we had a, a senior high. 
so I could go to a, a high school that had really top-notch teachers um, and they would have three classes, three chemistry classes, for example, in year 12, which most country high schools didn't have. Mm. Um, so I, I ended up at the University of Melbourne. I did an undergraduate degree in medicine, was amongst the f about four first uh, medical graduates with um, um, Indigenous medical graduates. I um, left medicine kind of really wanting to more work on health change uh, in Indigenous mm. health. So kind of more the public health than the clinical health end, although I had a, um, some really fabulous years as an Aboriginal health worker and a GP at the Victorian Aboriginal Health Service. Um, and it was there that kind of um, created within me a kind of an ambition to really change things, um, to do what I could within you know, my skills and opportunities to make a difference in Aboriginal health. Along the way, I had uh, done some work with um, 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 some of the folks in Victoria and a, a lot of my kind of early thinking, my professional development, my community building stuff had been in, in the Victorian Aboriginal community. Um, and I'd worked in the state government um, uh, whilst I was doing my medical degree and worked on um, a textbook on Aboriginal health, which is one of the early ones in the country for teaching medical students. And in the course of doing that, I kind of really realised that actually, um, although we understood that Aboriginal health was bad in the South, we actually didn't have a lot of research that actually helped us mm -hmm. demonstrate how that was. Mm. So I got really interested in the use of data and the use of research and how you do that in a way that uh, can really drive change in, in, in some ways by making the case uh, around what the health issues are, what the health priorities are, but also to and actually starting to uh, show ways in which you can improve uh, health outcomes. So all, all that experience was, was pretty f formative uh, for me that later led to me to kind of build my um, but full of professional life in, in, in health research, particularly Aboriginal health research. Mm. Um, thanks, Ian. I'd just like to, to add in that uh, very inspiring CV that uh, I have known Ian when he was first a student. So it's many years. So he came um, to the Lowerture Institute when he was f completely well established um, in, in, the, in Melbourne and in the, in the, res in the research, um, research world. So you remember, Ian, what you might remember, what do you remember? Maybe what are the highlights of the times that you came to the Lower Ching Institute? In the, I think in the first iteration, I think it was in the CRC for um, Aboriginal and Tropical Health. Yeah. Uh, and Ian joined us then as our head of research. So it was a little bit before I took, took on the, uh, I was actually on the board of the CRC for Aboriginal and Tropical Health. I was then at the University of Melbourne, and Pat, you're right, you were one of the aunties that used to look after us uh, Aboriginal students at the University of Melbourne. There was about 20 of us, so um, we got some special <laughs> attention. Um, uh, but, but I think that um, I had a little bit of experience of running health projects within um, the Aboriginal Community Controlled Health uh, Services at the Victorian Aboriginal Health Service. But the state of play was um, probably in the late 90s really re reflected um, to, to, my observation is particularly in the territory and mm. it's not so much in the south everyone knew each other and no one trusted anyone <laughs> um, uh, and true <laughs> uh, and, and th there was a there was a meeting I think um, and uh, in Darwin that uh, uh, very, very, very early on in the in the CRC for Aboriginal and Tropical Health, mm. and and we have to give credit to uh, John Matthews for really kind yes, of being indeed. brave enough mm. to set up an Aboriginal research organisation that brought together the researchers uh, and Aboriginal uh, um, leaders in Northern Territory, particularly from the community controlled sector. I'm not sure that he entirely knew 
uh, how much brokerage that would take. But there was a, a kind of particular meeting I remember um, <coughs> in, in some uh, venue in Darwin uh, that had enough space for all the Aboriginal mob to spend the whole day in one corner and all the research mob in the other corner and just every now and again there would be some t coming together and I, my memory of this, and this is, a, it's a, you know, it's, it's a while ago, but my memory of that <laughs> is being the messenger boy. <laughs> that Interpreter, translator. <laughs> that that <laughs> ran, ran between the two mobs and, and tried to build and broker uh, a relationship. But um, to, to be absolutely fair to everyone is everyone wanted to be there. Uh, but, but people didn't know how to build a working relationship. Uh, and particularly for the researchers at that time, um, used to working uh, in Aboriginal communities, but not with Aboriginal people as boss. And I think that that's the kind of, um, one of the things that was changing at the particular period of time. Um, there was um, some, some work done, uh, I think, by the National Health and Medical Research Council a, a few years earlier. Uh, that investigated uh, outcomes from uh, research funding programs over a whole NHMRC triennium. And I think the, the kind of the stark conclusion was is about 50% of the research projects failed. These, these are well-intentioned researchers, researchers um, decently designed projects, and they failed for three reasons. One is uh, a disagreement around the ethics of research, uh, a failure to build collaboration, and then um, some issues around the inappropriate use of uh, project methods, or the project methods weren't well designed for working in, say, for example, research, uh, remote context. So I, I always understood that that was the mission of the CRC mm. for Aboriginal Health, is actually fundamentally dealing with uh, those three issues. How, how do we build um, better ways of collaboration how do we bake in Indigenous leadership? How do we ensure that the project outcomes are really, uh, there's a mechanism to translate that into, into practice in terms of improved uh, services, improved policy? And how do we underpin that with a robust ethical framework that uh, Aboriginal Australians are, are willing to work with? Um, so, so that was a long journey um, and those early days, uh, those kind of days when I was the messenger boy, um, <laughs> uh, were, were just the beginning. Yeah, I, I, I remember that well because for the first time ever we were telling researchers that, um, hang on a bit, we are going to set the research agenda mm. and, then, uh, and people didn't like that. And it was mm. Ian being a bit polite here but it was a very volatile uh, meeting and Lower Chair O'Donoghue herself, if you remember, she was the chair and we were sort of, she was asking you to interpret, Ian, what are they saying now? What are they telling us now, Ian? And it went backwards and forwards all day. Um, so it was a big, I think it was a big break for them because I think we announced for the first time in, in retrospect that we were going to take control and charge of the research agenda for us. And that's how it all kind of, started yeah. I think when we were, I had to articulate that to some very um, unhappy <laughs> researchers at the time but like was I think that was about 1993 93 90 no it's 97 no it's 97 97, 97 98 yeah. excuse me that's that's right yeah. so Ian you've had a very long a very long career and um, had lots of successes and challenges mm. what do you think excites you now these days um Look, I, I think what's uh, actually really, really amazing to see is an emerging generation mm. of Indigenous researchers. You know, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, with PhDs who are going on to postdoctoral research. Uh, a lot of that has emerged from the work that we were doing in mm. the late 90s. I mean, um, it wasn't all driven by the Lower Tree Institute, but it no. was a pivotal part of that, that landscape. So we now have uh, a, a reasonable, you know, Indigenous research leadership across the country. We have um, uh, Aboriginal researchers who are, uh, Professor Sandra Yeats, who is now uh, a dean of a uh, 
Curtin Medical mm. School. Mm. Um, we've got myself in my kind of leadership role at the Australian National University. Uh, we've got um, really kind of mid-career researchers like uh, Ray Lovett at uh, university. Indeed. At, mm. at, at my university, the Australian National University. And there is a critical mass there that means that um, ch change is not going to, is not just coming, it's, it's come. And we're building a second generation of researchers. I, I think that the second thing that kind of I think is really exciting is the global connections that we've built yeah. uh, through that, res bo both research and uh, professional leadership in medicine and the health sciences. So um, it's not uncommon to work with Maori researchers, with mm. Um, mm. First Nations people in North America. Um, and those kind of links have really driven change in policy and policy outcomes. So um, so some of the work that the CRC did, um, CRC for Aboriginal Health, um, uh, as really, uh, like in areas for, for example, as the development of quality uh, CQI systems or continuous quality improvement mm. in Aboriginal Health yeah. Services has driven improvements in service practice. Um, the work that uh, was done through uh, uh, the Lowerture Institute or the CRC for Aboriginal Health and with other um, 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 uh, indigenous leaders, for example, has put issues such as indigenous tobacco control on the mm. national agenda. Mm. So I can I can see a kind of a whole way in which we can understand where that collaborative research that we built uh, through the CRC and the Lowerture Institute has made a demonstrable change in policy, demonstrable change in uh, s services quality and has led to improved health, health outcomes. Mm. It's hard to imagine now, but in 1993 when we, when we first started the first um, CRC, there were probably only two researchers around the country, our researchers, that had any reputation at all working nationally, in fact, was yourself and Professor Marcy Langton. So we have this whole other generation, yep. generation and a half now, um, that are actively engaged and earning their reputation as being, you know, first class researchers. So, so, so for listeners out there, it was 97, 98, um, Pat's ageing me. <laughs> <laughs> I was just leaving medicine <laughs> in 93. Why do I keep sticking, sticking on 90s? I have to check this, so sorry about that, everybody. Um, what are the biggest barriers these days, um, given that there's so many more um, of us out there, you know, to so, research? So, so, research. so I think um, uh, the, the kind of the real challenges is um, still really the educational pathway. Mm. Um, we're, we're making huge mm. gains in terms of uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids who finish year 12, and that's one of the, uh, the national targets that is on track. But we're still um, not getting the educational platforms for those um, kids in the primary and secondary school. Uh, so they're completing without necessarily being completely ready for tertiary education. The second challenge, I think, um, is opening up stronger pathways for the science, technology, engineering and maths uh, mm -hmm. for Indigenous students. This is a, uh, a general challenge in Australian education, but a very particular one in, um, for Indigenous education. And that STEM pathway does limit the kind of possibilities in university education. So mm. I'd, I'd like mm. to see, um, s and there has been a, a lot of work on trying to build, uh, foster and nurture Indigenous interest in the sciences and the maths and technology areas in secondary school, but we need to do much more. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Now at the ANU, what excites you about your role there and uh, about the work sort of moving for, uh, forward? Um, so, so at the Australian National University, I, I have a portfolio um, that has a broad focus on um, thinking about uh, diversity and the values across the campus community. Mm. 
um, uh, particularly to support equity pathways, um, to support inclusion across the campus. I have um, uh, a, a role in the on-campus um, residential uh, experience. So oh, there, yes. are, there are 6,000 students who live on campus at ANU and that I'm uh, responsible for and a role tackling some of the more uh, challenging aspects of university experience, including uh, sexual harassment, sexual assault. I, I think it's, um, um, it's, it's a fabulous job um, and a really opportunity to work with um, a, a leading national uh, university. Mm. But I think the kind of real challenge for the Australian National University is thinking about how it strengthens its national role and strengthens its mm. national impact. And I think in uh, there's, a, there's a place there for it to play, uh, um, to build on its strengths in Indigenous education and research mm -hmm. and then take it to the next level. And that's something which I would work with um, uh, Peter Yu, who's our Vice President f uh, for First Nations and other uh, Indigenous leaders across the ANU, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, and there's a little community being established there within ANU pretty much yeah. as we speak. Do you have any special quote or mantra uh, that motivates you and that you hold close? Uh, yeah, um, keep on keeping on. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, it's a bit like that. I'm not, <laughs> not very good at literary <laughs> metaphors, um, but I, I think that the kind of the it's a kind of, it's a childhood thing. I'm, my, my mother would say that I'm relatively stubborn. Um, I think. You know, getting into a sandstone university at the age of 18 with the sort of um, educational opportunities that that provides, given that there was no one else in my family who went to university ever, um, was kind of um, a good example, Mum, of being very pig-headed and very stubborn. And the fact that you told me at the age of 15 I couldn't do it <laughs> meant that I would. <laughs> have to prove them all wrong. Yeah, <laughs> including my mother. Yes. Love you. I know you're out there. <laughs> all right. For NADOC, this, this year the theme is always was, always would be. What do you, how do you personally respond to that? So, so I, I, I think that that's, um, it's a beautiful theme. Um, mm. It kind of, for, for me, it's actually being about, it reminds us to be incredibly authentic around the things that matter. Um, the things that matter to us is place and country and where, you, where you're born from, where, you, where you're grown from. For, for most um, Aboriginal Australians, most Aboriginal Australians don't live on their country. Mm. Um, probably about 80% live off country in cities, in places they've migrated to. And I think it's a reminder to all of us to continue to foster those cultural connections to enable uh, that generation coming up to grow up uh, with a stronger sense of identity, um, with a, a way to connect, particularly with language, I think, mm. um, but also to find ways to maintain those connections to place. In, in some ways, I think that that's, um, that's what we offer the world. It's mm. a sense of who we are and a sense of place. And in a global community that is very dis disconnected um, from place and self and, and land and ecology and all that sort of stuff, um, what we offer is incredibly valuable. It's incredibly rich, both to ourselves but I think to the broader human uh, community. So I, I, I think that that's why um, that is such an important theme. That's perfect. That's a very inspiring response, sir. <laughs> Ian. Uh, thank you very much. Do you have anything else that you'd want to add, uh, especially to researchers or people out there? I, I, I think that... Um, Kind of what I was saying to myself, I keep on keeping on, it, it actually is a challenge. Um, yeah. uh, you think that doing your PhD is tough, 
well, the next few years tough and the few years after it. Research is often involve living in a kind of terminal insecurity where you worry about your next publication, you worry about mm. your next grant. Take the long view. It actually does make a difference. So, thank you. No, um, thanks Ian. Thank you for watching this first episode of Lower to Live and thanks again to Professor Ian Anderson. We hope you're enjoying NADOC week and getting out to celebrate. See you next time.